I like that song. <laughs> Living in the heart of God. We're working in the heart of God. And we're dreaming in the heart of God. And the heart of God today is weeping. It's weeping. Because this amazing planet, this amazing earth, that it took the universe 14 billion years to give birth to is itself weeping, is itself in peril and endangered. This version of it, the earth will outlive our species if we continue to be foolish and in denial and stupid and selfish. The earth will go on. But the marvelous diversity, the marvelous creations, <coughs> The beasties, the elephants, the leopards, the polar bears, the whales, the rainforests, the parrots, birds, reptiles, the insects, they're all endangered by the work or lack of work of one species that is kind of going off the rails. That's us, humans. Thomas Aquinas, one of the great thinkers of Western civilization, in 13th century said, one human being can do more evil than all the other species put together. When I read that in Aquinas about 10 years ago, my spine got Erect. I was kind of proud. Oh, we're getting at, good at something. <laughs> I mean, that's a big deal. One human being. This is 700 years before Stalin or Hitler or Pol Pot. How did Aquinas know that human beings could do no more evil than all the other species put together? Because in his pre-modern consciousness, a consciousness like indigenous people carry within them, he was aware that human creativity and the power of our intellects can do good things and can do very stupid things. And of course, currently, we are doing very stupid things. I was at a conference um, in January of, 20, of uh, 2016, yeah, during the presidential primaries, in Florida, and the conference was on climate change and the rising of the seas. And the conference was held in northern Florida, near where the governor's mansion is, and he had just put out a documentation a few months earlier saying no one working for the government of Florida is allowed to use the word climate change in their emails. <laughs> that proclamation has since been adapted by our current president and he's applied it to bigger government circles. And at that time, January 2016, there were two presidential candidates running for the office from Florida, each of them in denial about climate change. So here we have this conference, and the first speaker Friday night was a scientist. He got up and he had some slides. He showed a picture of Florida today. He said, at the rate we're going, 10 years from now, chop. This is what Florida will look like. 20 years from now, chop, chop. This is what Florida will look like. 30 years from now, chop, chop, chop. This is what Florida will look like. Well, one lesson I learned was I wouldn't invest in real estate in Florida. <laughs> I, I would invest in dinghies and rubber boots. And I, I visited South Miami, and there was four inches of water on the sidewalks, and their governor, and their two, and a former governor, and a current senator, were all in denial about climate change. So our capacity for denial cannot be underestimated. <laughs> Again, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, said this about denial. He said, a person who chooses to be ignorant of something that is important. And that's what denial is. It's a choice to be ignorant. And in this case, about something really important, like the survival of the planet as we know it. Such a person, says Thomas Aquinas, is committing mortal sin. 
what mortal sin means is a deadly virus is coursing through your soul and into the community because we extend what's going on in us into the community. That's what mortal sin means. So what are some solutions? Well, I had this dream two and a half years ago. And the dream woke me up at four in the morning. And it said this, do it, capital letters and four exclamation points, do it. <laughs> and I'd never had a dream like that in my life with an order so specific. And what was the it that it was telling me to do at four in the morning and that woke me up? To start a new order, a spiritual order, not a religious order. A gathering of people who feel from their hearts, who work from their hearts, that we can and need to do something, create a community about healing Mother Earth and standing up to the forces that are destroying her in our time. And there would be one vow for this community to join this order. And that vow is, I promise to be the best lover of Mother Earth and the best defender of Mother Earth that I can be. That's the one vow. No vow of celibacy, that's good news. <laughs> no vow of poverty, no vow of obedience. Although, the, the wisdom of those vows are incorporated, um, I think, in that one vow. Because we all do have to be responsible about economics, poverty, about relationship and decision making, that's obedience, and of course about our relationships and our sexuality. So I was telling a young man, a friend of mine who runs our Cosmic Mass, Skylar Wilson, he was 32 at the time, about my dream. And he said, wow, he said, I had a dream that same week and I think it's very compatible. He said, I dreamt that we were a group. There was a group of people, young people at the beach. And uh, we were talking about things and creating community, getting along together. And then we all levitated. Whoops. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Little show and tell there. Levitated over San Francisco, he said. So, make a long story short, he and I and his girlfriend, Jen Listig, started this Order of the Sacred Earth. Uh, we took our first vows in a group of 80 people at a Buddhist center in uh, Berkeley on the solstice a year ago. Not the most recent solstice, but a year ago. And 80 people showed up, and there were indigenous people, there were... Um, Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus and at least one atheist because a 28 year old woman came up to me afterwards she said I'm an atheist but I'm looking for a community that shares my values I heard about this group I want in these are my values too so I think it's very that's why I call this a spiritual order not a religious order because it is not bound to any one religious headquarters or ideology but um, it calls on the diverse wisdom of our species. What do the Muslims have to say about this issue of survival? What do the Buddhists have to say? What do the Jews have to say? What do atheists have to say? Let's pool our wisdom and get on with it, with the task. So we put out this book, Order of the Sacred Earth, an intergenerational vision of love and action. And that word intergenerational is so important. Young people today, as you know, are not flooding the churches. Uh, and uh, as I say today, the, the sign of our times, one sign of our times, is the souls, S-O-L-E-S, -E of people leaving the churches. You see, seeing the, the feet leaving the churches. This is a sign of our times. In Spain today, 12% of Catholics are practicing. Spain, which used to be up around 80. In Ireland, it used to be 85 or 90 percent, it's down to about 15 percent now. So clearly, this is a sign of our times. Religion as we know it is fading. But I think there's a reason for that. 
And that is that Gaia is saying, hey, this thing is front and center. You don't have to carry, carry all the baggage. As I say, we don't have to operate with basilicas on our back anymore. Backpacks. Backpacks will do. We need to travel light in our spiritual work today. Find ways to find silence and deep listening that are available and then put that deep listening to work, to common work. And so the three of us, um, Skylar, Jennifer, Jennifer was 28 when he started the order, Skylar was 32, and then myself, we wrote the first half of this book, each of us wrote an essay on the order. And then the second half is small essays, two pages or three by various people, um, Mirabai Starr and David Corton, and then Brian Swim, the cosmologist whom you heard from this morning. That, that essay came from this book about, but, and we asked these people, various people, to give feedback about their vision of the order, what the order might be to them at this time. And that was that beautiful reading this morning from Brian Swim, pointing out that a hydrogen atom just sits around for a billion years until it's invited into community into a star, and then it does whole new things. It gives birth to living beings. So we put that out there. I think that's an amazing vision, that what we can do together, working out of a spiritual community, not just out of political fighting, reptilian brain against reptilian brain, <laughs> but out of our deeper selves. Now already we have about we call the communities pods, and we have about 45 of them who've sprung up around North America, and there's one in Peru and in Australia, and, um, um, and about 1,500 people so far have, kind of, have taken the vow. Some take it individually, but it's most powerful to take it in a group. So I'm gonna throw out the invitation that you here in Walnut Creek area, that you start starting some pods and um, you can go to the web page and so forth and see how to do this. But these pods are self-organizing. We're, we're treating each other like adults. We're not giving orders, we do it this way, and here's 2,000 canon laws to run it. Oh my God, save us. <laughs> and 55 dogmas, no thank you, no. No, it, it's simpler than that. The song we sang this morning about choosing love, I said about choosing love. Not just for our generation, but especially for the future generations. And that's why inter the intergenerational wisdom is so important here. Because we older folks, it's our job to sustain and support the younger ones. But they're the ones, the younger generation, the ones facing this apocalyptic time. And it's so serious that I meet a lot of young couples today that are asking, do we dare bring a child into the world today? It's a serious question today. That's how serious this is. We're talking about generations to come, and not just the humans. Think beyond the humans. The whales have been here 55 million years longer than we have. Do they have a right to exist in the future? And the elephants, and the polar bears, and the forests, and the rest? This is what it's about. It's about waking up to the sacredness of this relationship, this web, this web of creation that is our species and all these other species. So um, what is an order then? Well, of course, there are orders in the East and in the West. So the Buddhists have orders. The Hindus have orders. The Sufis have orders, for sure. And of course, uh, Christians have orders. The Roman Catholic Church has orders, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Anglicans, and some others. So when do orders happen? Well, when I look at history of religion in the West, I notice the third century. In the third century, the Christian Church started flirting with the empire. They're dating, you might say, kind of dating the empire. <laughs> And some young people with conscience, because that is when conscience is most alive, is when we're young, and this should not be forgotten. There are fewer compromises when you're young. Your ideals are still cooking. 
these young people said, well, this doesn't sound like what Jesus was talking about to me. Let's leave the city and leave this, this flirting with the empire and go into the desert. We know these people today as, quote, the desert fathers and the desert mothers. And we draw pictures of them. They have long white beards and all this stuff. It, they started as young people <laughs> who abandoned the, abandoned the system and went to live a life of greater integrity in the desert and where they could not be inscripted into the army to kill people in the name of Jesus. Then the fifth century, now in the fourth century, the church married the empire. So the, the courting was done. They got married. Then you have the Nicene Creed and all this stuff. The fifth century, you have St. Benedict and his sister St. Scholastica starting the Benedictine monastic movement. And it became very powerful and very important. It did sustain a civilization through their scholarship, their schools, and their agrarian activities, their, their agriculture for centuries during what we call the Dark Ages, which really were the Cold Ages. Europe was very, very cold in, in that time. But in the 12th century, a couple of things happened. One is that the, the currents shifted in the Atlantic Ocean and Europe warmed up. So you had a much longer growing period, and so you had larger families. And the feudal system did not have work for the young people. There were a lot of unemployed young people very restive. And they were not pleased with the religious structures of the time, which were all built around the monastic power. And the monasteries were corrupt. They were fat. The monks were fat and lazy. They were committed to the feudal system, which in fact was dying. And, um, and religion was dying. And so what happened at the end of the 12th century? St. Francis, who's already been mentioned this morning, and, Hil and well, Hildegard was trying to reform other Benedictines in the 12th century. But St. Francis and St. Dominic emerged on the scene. They were peers, they were contemporaries. Started the Dominican order and the Franciscan order, a new version of Christianity at the time. And I want to stress, especially because St. Francis' name has already been invoked, that we have to rescue Francis from the bird bath. <laughs> especially out here in suburbia. He's probably well represented in our bird baths. And I say that not that I have anything against bird baths or birds, but because Francis was a radical reformer, a radical reformer trying to shake the church up in its pathology and its stupidity in the 12th century and, and its alliance with the powers instead of with the poor. So one of his ideas was this. He said, in my order, the Franciscan order, we will not have priests. We will all be brothers. I don't want any of my brothers to enter the priesthood, become clerical, and start climbing up that clerical ladder where awful things can happen <laughs> because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But you know, his order became very successful very fast because it was very timely. Like I think the order of the sacred earth is very timely. There's so little competition out there <laughs> for healthy religion today, it could really catch on. So Francis, in just a year or so of founding his order, had over 5,500 members, just the male side. There's a female side as well, St. Claire, who was his girlfriend. She started the Clares, now known as the poor Clares, because they were locked up. The women were locked up and not allowed to preach, whereas both Claire and Francis' vision was that the women should preach too and help reform the church that way. But within, so what they did, they took Francis' order away from him. And they reconstituted it, made it clerical and all that. And Francis died two years later of the stigmata, I think he died of a broken heart. They took his vision away, they took his baby away, and killed it. And he was so smart and intuitive. Within the next generation, the Franciscans were running the Inquisition. And so were the Dominicans. 
So this is why we want to learn from history both its good lessons and its shadow lessons. This is why you don't want an order that's affiliated with a church body, with a big institution like that. They might turn you in, in, into inquisitors. So the idea then of this order being our spiritual order is that yes, it gathers the wisdom that is now available around the world every day. We're rubbing elbows with Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and indigenous people, goddess people, pagan people, and various versions of Christianity, and atheists. So why wouldn't an order that mirrors our time be an order that invites everyone around one focused ideal? A 26-year-old woman wrote me when she heard about the order. She said, you know, this is exactly what my generation needs. We are so dispersed by social media. We're all over the place. There's so much distraction. We need a focus. And she said, I can't think of any focus that makes more sense than focusing on the survival of the planet, taking that vow about the survival of the planet. So, an order of the sacred earth, I think, is an invitation to all of us, some to join and some just to pray with and think about. But I hope that some pods come out of this, this uh, gathering today. Um, uh, and I think that it's a, it's a marvelous mid-step between church and nothing. <laughs> It is a community, and part of it, of course, will be online. Every month now, we have a Zoom meeting, and anyone's invited to join it, where we talk, and there's this group from Peru that gets on, talks about what they're doing in Peru. There's a group from Australia and, and other parts of North America. So um, that's one way that it'll operate, but locally, of course, in your own bioregion, it's about your pod, and you people will meet, and you will m act as adults. What does this vow mean to you? How do you translate it? What does it mean to your work, to your study, uh, to your citizenship? Uh, how can you put it into practice um, where you are? And then each pod will, will become its own, uh, take on its own personality and its own agenda. And this is a self-organizing, a self-organizing organization. Or we say it's not an organization, it's an organism. So it's a self-organizing organism, these pods are. And uh, that's how the universe works. Why shouldn't humans start working as self-organizing instead of top-down organizing? Enough of that. <laughs> that's where patriarchy has, has reigned long enough. So I think that this, the musicians saying wonderfully of this, the call of Mother Earth, um, the dream I had was a call and I'm sharing it with you because I know it was not meant just for me. It was what the <laughs> native people call a big dream, which means a dream for the community, not just for the individual. And uh, so I'm glad to be worshiping with you again at Walnut Creek Unity of Walnut Creek. And I'm pleased to be able to share this, uh, this uh, intergenerational vision of love and action that we call the order of the sacred earth. And I look forward to meeting more of you this afternoon. We'll be talking about some other subjects, especially the subjects of the multiple, multiple, wonderful, wonderful names for God. A friend of mine who I shared my recent book on this subject with said, it took the top of his head off <laughs> with, with what I had to say about the invitation to, um, to welcome again the diverse names for divinity and to come up with our own and ones that echo the, the, the science of our time as well as the hearts of our time. Boy, I am really falling apart up here. <laughs> I think my time is done. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.